episode 593. The scar belongs to Claire. Claire froze in confusion. What is he talking about? She thought. Noel shrugged and started to smile. I was only joking, she said. I didn't think anyone would actually believe me. She then looked at Claire. Are you really that gullible? She asked. And if you believe he got hurt protecting me, then why are you here? That's our business, Peter replied coldly. Don't tell me you still haven't told her the real reason you're in the hospital, Noelle said. Do you want me to tell her for you? What are you talking about? Claire asked as she stood up and glared at Noelle. What am I talking about? Noelle repeated. You might want to know that the person who actually hurt Peter was your jerk of a father. Your father stabbed him and then hit him with his car. And while Peter was supposed to be recovering in the hospital, he snuck out to buy you food from your favorite childhood restaurant. How ridiculous is that? Claire stood in silence, absorbing her words. But Noelle wasn't finished. Don't you know that your father is out of control? He only stabbed Peter because Peter was trying to protect you. If he hadn't interfered, your father would have gone after you, and you would probably be in the morgue right now. Claire was dumbfounded, but then she remembered what Peter had said earlier. He wanted her to remember what he had said about everything being worthwhile. Now she realized that Peter was talking about her, not Noel. What? Are you shocked? Noel said as her voice became bitter. It's too bad that you don't really care about Peter. If I thought that you did, I wouldn't have bothered coming here today. It's time for you to admit it, Noel continued. Neither of us has treated Peter well. In fact, I think you're just a poor reflection of me. That's enough, Peter said. I know you don't want to see me, Noel said to Peter, suddenly becoming emotional. But you should at least have some perspective. If my only competition is this ungrateful brat, then I think you would be better off with me. Peter just shook his head. I've told you before. Our relationship is over. Whether or not Claire and I have a future, you and I are done. I need you to recognize that. You need to recognize that, or you will never be able to be happy. Sometimes I think you're pitiful, Peter. You really have no luck in finding someone who loves you the way that you love them, do you? As she moved to the door, she stopped to glower at Claire before giving her some parting words. Good luck. You're going to need it. And then Peter and Claire were left alone in an awkward silence. Why didn't you asking me that when you thought I'd gotten hurt because of Noel? Peter said with a laugh. But he lifted his shirt and showed her his bandaged side. As Claire looked at the damage, she felt like she was the one who had been hurt, as the ache in her heart 
felt like a wound itself. What's with that look on your face? Peter asked. Please tell me you're not thinking of trying to repay me with some extreme sacrifice or anything. Claire helped him straighten his clothes and then asked, Where is my father now? Did you call the police? Are they looking for him? He got away, Peter replied. I don't know where he is. I'm not going to let him get away with this, Claire said as she gritted her teeth. She stood up and began to gather her belongings. Get some rest. I have some things I need to take care of. Where are you going? Peter asked as he reached out to hold her back. I'm going to the office, and then I need to find my father, she stated. It's clear that he's a menace, and he needs to be stopped. Peter watched her walk out of the room, and then took a deep breath. He shook his head helplessly as he pushed himself out of bed. I can't just let her go after him on her own, he thought. When Claire said she was going to look for her father, she was relying on the fact that she was now in charge of Baines International and that Edward still had a lot of minions in the company. Perhaps through them, she would be able to find out where he was hiding. Of course, she wasn't stupid. She couldn't directly ask if anyone had seen him. So she instructed her personal assistant to install a camera in the boardroom and call the senior executives in for an urgent meeting. Her plan was simple. She was going to tell everybody that she would not assume control of Baines International after all, and that she had only announced the takeover out of anger. Now, she just wanted to find her father and reconcile with him. She would happily hand the company back to him and take a back seat once again. After she made this announcement, she planned to sit back and see how they reacted. Claire might have had trouble maintaining a poker face at times, but there was nothing wrong with her ability to strategize. She was going to find her father and get her revenge. She would never allow him to hurt anyone she loved ever again. Episode 594 We are not the same. Peter was once again on the move, despite his injuries. When he arrived at the reception desk of Baines International, the receptionists were shocked to see him. I'm looking for Claire Baines, as she returned. Miss Baines is currently in a meeting, one of the receptionists said as she pointed to the waiting area. Why don't you sit here? I'll make a phone call and check when she'll be available. Peter took a seat, and the receptionist called up to Claire's office. She's ready for you to go up, the receptionist said. Do you know the way? Peter quickly made his way to Claire's office. He had been worried that she would act recklessly and go off searching for her father. But, to his surprise, as he stepped into her office, he found her discussing the incident with the police. This is twice in one day that I'm asking you this question, 
Are you crazy? Claire asked as she ran over to Peter and helped him sit down on the sofa. I was worried that if you found Edward, World War III would break out, Peter said. I'm not irresponsible, Claire said. I don't know the first thing about tracking down someone who doesn't want to be found. Can't you see that I've asked the police for help? You need rest. Let me get someone to drive you back to the hospital. I'm fine, Peter protested. I don't need to be in the hospital. I would only be laying down and I can do that here. As long as I don't make any sudden moves, I'll be okay. You guys go ahead and carry on. Truthfully, this couch is a lot more comfortable than the hospital bed, Peter thought. And the view is a lot nicer, too. He grinned, enjoying watching Claire at work. Claire gave up and let out a sigh then turned back to the police officer. My father and my grandfather are on bad terms, so there's no way he would turn to him for help. As for his closest friends, I've already written down their names for you. Just a few minutes ago, I held an urgent meeting and released some false information. I told people that my father was going to resume control of the company. I'm hoping that someone will contact him to let him know. As the meeting ended, I noticed a few people were on their phones. I suspect that one of them was notifying him about what they'd just been told. If you can follow those individuals who were on their phones... I'm sure you'll discover something. Thanks for your cooperation. You've been very helpful, said one of the police officers. I am surprised that no one from your department came to talk to me, Claire said. I would have been happy to help earlier. I didn't even know that my father was involved in the attack on Peter until just a little while ago. I don't know anything about that, but I'll pass along your comment, one of the officers said. After, the police left the office. Claire turned to Peter and crossed her arms. I am upset that you didn't tell me that my father was responsible for hurting you. Why would you keep something like that from me? Do you think I'm not strong enough to handle that kind of information? It's not that, Peter said awkwardly. You're right. I absolutely should have told you. But I didn't want you to feel obligated to go out with me in return. This all sounds kind of twisted now. I'm sorry. Claire rubbed her neck, taken aback by Peter's frankness. Let's go. I'll take you back to the hospital. Why can't you just stay where you're supposed to be and let someone else take care of you? Again, you're right, Peter responded. You're very capable, and I will let you get to work. Don't worry about me. I can get back to the hospital on my own. Claire accompanied Peter downstairs and out of the building. But as she looked down at his side, she noticed some blood seeping through. And an idea came to her for something she had never considered before. Claire asked her personal assistant to arrange an appointment for her at a tattoo parlor. That's right. I'm getting a tattoo, she proclaimed when her assistant expressed surprise. 
It was the closest thing she could think of to experiencing how it must feel to be stabbed repeatedly in the stomach. What type of tattoo would you like to get? The tattoo artist asked. Claire sat down on the sofa and began thinking about Peter's handsome face. He was both silly and heartwarming. Even though he had suffered so much pain, he was still willing to sacrifice himself and still have enough courage to love. These qualities reminded her of something. I want a tattoo of a dog's paw with a heart, she said. Anything else? Can you put the name Peter into the design? She asked. Of course. Are you ready? Claire began to sweat, but she had no qualms about what she was about to do. She did wonder if Peter would be concerned that she had taken the bold step of tattooing his name on her body. But now that she had decided to pursue a relationship with him, she felt no hesitation. Because she had suffered so much in the past, she cherished moments when others treated her well. When it came to those who would go out of their way for her, she would be willing to go to any lengths for them. While the tattoo artist was getting his instruments ready, Claire pulled out her phone and called Noelle. You were wrong, she said. I am nothing like you. The only reason I was slow to respond to Peter was that I didn't realize how he felt about me. That's completely different from the indifference you showed him. Just like I told you earlier, your relationship with him is over. But mine is just beginning. On the other end of the line, Noelle remained silent. She had appeared at the hospital today because she wanted Claire to know what Peter had done for her. If Peter was with someone who loved him, she could let him go. To be honest, I'm actually quite jealous of you, said Noelle, taking another gulp of her wine. By the way, did he tell you that we had a one-night stand? I really don't care, Claire replied. It's in the past. We are about to start our own chapter together. Let's hope you stand by your words. Otherwise, I will do whatever it takes to show him that he should be with me. Noelle warned before hanging up the phone. She still had a sliver of hope that Claire would disappoint Peter. But all she could do now was wait and see. Now that I've let go of Peter, I wonder if Emma will get off my case, she thought. After all, her fear of Emma was part of the reason that she had given up on Peter in the first place. Episode 595 A Grandfather's Decision Over the next few days, Emma's performance at the annual film awards dominated the entertainment news headlines. At the same time, old news about Emma had resurfaced and was gaining momentum all over again. But... Emma, aside from giving her reaction to the award ceremony, once again disappeared from the limelight. This time, she wasn't trying to hide her pregnancy or protect her privacy. 
She was keeping close tabs on Jenna. Jenna, despite being found out more than once, continued to scam people with the counterfeit notes she had found in her rental apartment. Whenever someone would catch on to her, she would use her own considerable acting skills to avoid the consequences. Of course, this only worked because she had yet to come across someone as despicable as herself. The men Luke had sent to keep an eye on her never deviated from their orders. But seeing Jenna pass off counterfeit money over and over was hard for them to watch. If Luke hadn't asked us to keep her safe for a few more days, I would have turned her into the cops myself by now, one of them said. I know, right? said his partner. She spends all day scamming people and doesn't even give a thought to the fact that her poor kid could end up being born in prison. Every time someone figured out that Jenna was passing counterfeit money, these two men would clean up after her and pay off the victims. But this time, Jenna would not be so lucky. Feeling an urge for caviar, she had gone into a small upscale market and made a purchase. Wanting to leave before anyone had a chance to scan the bills, she hurried out of the door. Her hurried movements happened to catch the eye of the manager, however. The manager, who was about nine months pregnant, called after her to stop and sent her security guard out into the parking lot. The security guard ran after Jenna to prevent her from getting in her car. And the manager called out, The money you gave me is fake. No, it's not, Jenna said. I just got it out of the bank this morning. I know this is a scam. You're trying to get more money from me, but you're out of luck. This is all you're going to get. After practicing for such a long time, Jenna had become a natural actress. The manager slowly made her way out to talk to Jenna. I checked the bills you gave me, and they are fake. There are surveillance cameras all over the store that can prove this is the money you paid with. If you'd bought something small, I wouldn't have bothered. I'm too pregnant to chase people down over a small loss. But the price of those groceries could pay for my hospital fees. No way I'm letting you get away with that. Leave me alone. Just because you're about to pop and feeling cranky, you don't have to take it out on me, Jenna said as she pushed the manager away. The force she applied almost caused the manager to slip and fall. Luckily, the security guard caught her from behind and helped her gain her balance. It's bad enough that you're using counterfeit bills, but now you're trying to hurt someone, said the intimidating-looking man as he approached Jenna. Jenna became nervous as she looked at this bulky man. It wasn't me, she said. Who are you trying to fool? It was obviously you, lady, one observer shouted. Soon, a small crowd had gathered. As they surrounded her, there was nowhere for Jenna to retreat. She decided to use her own pregnancy as a shield. What are you going to do? I'm pregnant. You can't hit me. The manager is pregnant too, and you weren't bothered about that when you shoved her just now, the guard said. Look, 
Just give me back the shopping bag, and I'll let you go, he said. But I don't want to see you here ever again. He reached out and grabbed the bag, but Jenna held on, not willing to give up her caviar. Come on, the guard said. This is your last chance, or I'm calling the cops. He gave one last tug and pulled the bag away. As Jenna let go, however, she lost her balance and fell hard, landing belly first on the hard pavement. I can't believe you would do that to a pregnant woman, she yelled as she slowly pushed herself up to a sitting position. But no one had sympathy for her. You're fine. Just get up and stop yelling. You're lucky no one called the cops on you. One of the bystanders said. The crowd dispersed, but Jenna remained sitting in the parking lot, suddenly too weary to stand up. She didn't notice anything out of the ordinary at first, but eventually realized that her clothes felt wet. Help me! Help me! It hurts! Jenna whimpered, but no one was around to hear. She struggled to get up as her vision became blurry, but soon sank to the ground again. As she slid into unconsciousness, the two men with orders to watch over her finally ran over to help. Realizing she had finally gotten assistance, Jenna felt a sense of warmth as she slowly closed her eyes. I'm going to be okay now. Everything will be all right, she thought. Jeff Miller rushed to the hospital as soon as he heard about Jenna's incident. He was just rushing into the emergency room as Jenna was arriving by ambulance. Grandfather, help me! I can't take this pain anymore, she said. You and my great-grandchild will be okay, he said. I'm here. And the doctors are going to take care of you. Jenna relaxed and closed her eyes. After a little while, the doctors came out to talk with Jeff. I need to tell you that things are not going well, she said. We need to get that baby out. But there's a chance that one or both of them will not survive. Jeff looked up, tears in his eyes. Jenna has done so many truly evil things in her life. I can't help thinking that whatever happens is meant to be. If it comes down to needing to make a choice, please just save the baby. Episode 596, Make Jenna Pay. The doctors found Jeff's decision strange and unsettling. It was rare to see someone who seemed to hate his own granddaughter so much. But she had given him the power to make her medical decisions if she was unable all they could do was try to save both Jenna and her child. Even if Jeff didn't care what happened to Jenna in the process. Susan arrived at the hospital to keep Jeff company. She still hasn't come out? She asked him. Did she make it through the procedure okay? I don't know what's happening. But there's a possibility she may never come out, he said. And perhaps it's for the best, 
She can't escape the terrible things she's done. Someone has to hold her accountable. And if no one else will do that, then I will. The door for the waiting area opened, and the doctor came in to talk with Jeff and Susan. That was a close call, she said. Jenna and her baby are both safe. But since the baby is about two months premature, he'll need to stay in the incubator in the NICU for a while. You can visit them both in a few minutes, but Jenna is very weak, so she'll need some time to recover. Jeff's mind raced with the unkind things he wanted to say about his granddaughter at that moment, but he held his tongue. Do you want to go see Jenna? Susan asked. It sounds like she's in rough shape. I don't think I want to right now, he replied. Emma will be here soon, and she can go check on her. I'm going to go see my great-grandchild in the meantime. I have given Jenna more than enough chances to redeem herself, he thought. But with all she's done, it's clear that she's beyond help. Susan nodded and followed him as he walked to the NICU. This little baby represented their future, and she would love it with all her heart. But she would also do her best to make sure the baby wasn't raised by Jenna. After all the trauma she had been through, Jenna was exhausted. By the time she opened her eyes again, two hours had passed. She was surprised that the first person she now saw wasn't a doctor, a nurse, or even Jeff. It was Emma, standing beside the hospital room window. Jenna wanted to speak, but her throat was so dry that nothing came out. You're finally awake, Emma said. You have a beautiful baby boy. He's very little, so they're keeping him in an incubator for a while. Jenna glared at her as she tried to sit up straight, but the pain that shot through her lower body forced her to lie back down again. Stop pretending like you care about me and my baby, Jenna said. Why are you really here? I'm just here to talk to you and make sure you know your choices, Emma replied. What do you mean? Jenna asked. I mean that in addition to all your other schemes, we know you've been passing counterfeit money. There is something very wrong with you, Jenna. You almost had me killed more than once. You arranged for my mother to be kidnapped. You are not the best person to raise your child. So now, you have a choice. You can either agree to give up custody of this child... Or you can go to jail. It's up to you. But you are not going to be able to leave the hospital with this child. You're blackmailing me, Jenna yelled. How dare you? I'm his mother. I don't think you're capable of raising this child. But... The decision is yours. If you choose to turn yourself in and go to jail, you may eventually get out and have a relationship with him. But in the meantime, 
You cannot be responsible for a child. Jenna froze as her heart dropped, and she ran a hand over the bumpy incision on her belly. She struggled to sit up as the color drained from her face. I have also talked with the business office, Emma said, not waiting for a response. You apparently don't have health insurance. How do you think you are going to pay your hospital bills? Grandfather, Jenna started to say. Grandfather won't pay your bills, Emma said. He's agreed to pay for the baby's costs, but he won't cover yours. Unless you can get them to accept your counterfeit money, you're on your own. But I have no money, Jenna said. I can't pay any of these bills. What am I supposed to do? I don't know, Emma responded. But if you're just thinking about this now, that reinforces the fact that you are not able to be a good mother to your son. Jenna started frantically ringing the call bell, hoping someone would come help her figure all this out. When the nurse came in, Jenna asked how she was supposed to pay her bills. I can have someone from the business office talk with you, the nurse said. Perhaps they can set up a payment plan, and you can pay a little bit at a time. Jenna turned to Emma with tears in her eyes. Do you really have to push me into a dead end like this? She said. Feeling the tension rising between the two sisters, the nurse turned to leave. I'll let you two talk it out first she said. There's nothing to talk about, Emma said to Jenna, crossing her arms. You're on your own. Jenna hated being humiliated in front of Emma, so she threw off her blankets and forced herself to stand up. Forget it, she said. I'll leave the hospital right now. Let them track me down if they want my money. Not quite ready to be upright, Jenna started to lose her balance, and the nurse quickly helped her back onto the bed. Please, don't worry about this right now, the nurse said. I'll have someone from social services come talk with you. They can help you figure out your next steps. The nurse helped Jenna get settled in the bed and then left. Jenna looked at Emma and laughed until she cried. Are you happy now? She asked, wiping the tears from her eyes. Happy? Emma said. Nothing about this makes me happy. I don't hate you, and I don't want your son to grow up without a mother. But there is a poison in you that has to be dealt with. Jenna glared at Emma. How can you do this to me? You've won everything, and... I'm left with nothing. You're right, Emma said gently. But you can't deny that you brought all of this on yourself. She gave Jenna one last look and then left the room. She had said everything she had to say, but felt far more miserable than she'd imagined. She took no satisfaction in this outcome. She only knew that Jenna 
needed to be stopped and couldn't possibly raise a child. Meanwhile, the doctor who had delivered the baby entered the room to check on her condition. You should take it easy and focus on taking care of yourself, she said as she saw Jenna's red, sweaty face. Do you know where my grandfather is? Jenna asked. I need to see him.